and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, for all without end. Amen. Amen. In the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I wanted to keep that brief, but I also wanted to elucidate a point. Even that prayer, that very simple prayer of the glory be, was changed in the English translation uh, for in the post-Vatican II books of the Divine Office, or the Liturgy of the Hours. So if you ever hear somebody say, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever, amen, that's the English translation for the breviary, the Divine Office. And you ask yourself, why did they change the English translation of one of the most basic prayers of Christendom? That's a why question, and it's way too early to be answering why questions, okay? So, but it gives you a sense of literally everything uh, was up for change. In fact, in Italy, the Holy Father changed the translation of the Our Father. It's the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. Apparently, he didn't like that. Um, so, at any rate, uh, it's just an atmosphere of great, great change um, the last six years. All right, a couple things. Uh, first of all, um, this is not going to be a perfect lecture at, by any means. I'm going to be shooting from the hip mostly. It's not because I haven't studied this stuff. I've been studying it for 15 years. It's just that it's very complicated. And it's unprecedented in the life of the church. And quite honestly, the, the church is still working it out. And there's just a lot of disagreements from top to bottom in the church as to how do we understand these things. All right, so this won't be a perfect lecture. I'm going to do my best, especially in the first part, to be as objective as I can, just to explain all right, what happened. Okay, these are the facts. These are the people. Uh, I will give some of my own thoughts, uh, more so towards the end. If you have questions, I ask that if it's only if it's a question of clarification, feel free to ask it at any point. But if it's a why question, just hold it. Remember it, hold it. And if we have time at the end, I'll do my best because I want to be able to answer your questions the best I can. And some in some questions I won't be able to answer, especially some of the whys, because then you're questioning motives and intentions and stuff like that, and that can be. That can be kind of dangerous. I'm going to do my best not to just give you my preferences. Okay? I like coffee ice cream, chocolate ice cream, <laughs> salted caramel ice cream. These are things that I like. Okay? And you can't argue with me because these are things that I like. Okay? But what we want to do today is avoid, well, I like X in the liturgy. Because right, that's preference. And, okay, that's a preference. I like the, the Roman-style fiddleback over the French-style fiddleback. Like, so what? But today, we want to try to get into um, what actually happened. All right, so let's try do our best to avoid just saying, well, I like this reform. I didn't like this reform. That doesn't matter right now. Because um, we just need to understand what in the world happened. Now, why am I talking about this now? I've been a priest almost 10 years. I've never given a talk like this, and I've been thinking about this for over a month, whether or not to do it. And it's, well, because of the most recent document, uh, Traditionis Custodes, uh, by the Holy Father, uh, in which essentially he has declared war on the traditional Latin Mass. And that's not being hyperbolic at all. The best analogy I can think of is uh, somebody who owns uh, homes, and he has uh, tenants, and they're renting and perhaps this, is, uh, this owner is the son of the original owner. And the tenants had an agreement with the original owner. You can be here as long as you want. The house, this house is yours. You keep paying rent. You're fine. But then the son takes over. And he says, pack your bags tonight. You're out of here tomorrow. It doesn't matter if that house is better suited for your family. If your kids learn better with homeschooling there. You're being told, pack your bags tonight, unless you get a very special permission, and I want you out of here tomorrow, and never come back. That is what the most recent document of our Holy Father, who's been claiming mercy, 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 and accompaniment, 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 that is what he has done for a percentage of our brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church. He's told them to pack their bags. Even though these groups had agreements with the Vatican in 1988 and in 1992, perpetual agreement, you are safe here. 
you are welcomed here. And he's saying, pack your bags. So if the Holy Father, Pope Francis, wants to talk about the liturgy, we're going to start to talk about the liturgy. And I warn you, some of what I'll share with you today, it's going to be hard to hear. I've been a priest almost 10 years. I've not talked about these things publicly because they are hard to hear. But sometimes, you know, things happen and it's time to have a conversation. You know, I, I'm titling this talk, The Birds and the Bagninis, all right? <laughs> the Birds and the Bees. All right, we'll learn all about Bagnini, Archbishop Bagnini, okay? Um, but like children, understand that their younger brothers and sisters, uh, they're in mom's belly. That's what they understand, right? But then they reach a certain age and they realize, all right, well, this is how life comes into the world, all right? And maybe something, you know, more dramatic happens, like a, an older teenage sister gets pregnant or something like that, and mom and dad have to have a conversation with the kids. All right, this is, you know, it's sort of like, uh, all right, it's time for us to look behind the curtain. It's time for us to understand what is taking place, and especially in the age of scandals. All right, the scandals woke us up. All right, took the veil over, to, took the veil away from, away from our eyes to be able to see what's going on. And so what we saw in 2002 and 2018 would be moral scandals. But, and I've made this, I have made this point before, that it's not just morality, but it's also doctrine and liturgy. These three things go together. The three C's. Um, cult, which is worship. Creed, which is belief. Code, which is how you live. How you worship, what you believe, how you live. One of my arguments today is that the scandals that we obviously know exist on the moral side, they also exist on the theology side, the what we believe side, and on the liturgy side. Now today I'm going to focus more on the liturgy side, and we're going to see some of the scandals behind that. So if you don't have a stomach for it, you know, now's the time. Uh, it is kind of sobering, but I think it's time for us to address these things. All right. Um, I mean, full disclosure, you guys know that I'm more traditional. Okay. Well, you know what? I also say the new mass like five times a week. Okay. I live in both worlds. So again, I'm not here to give you my preferences, what I like. Uh, but I do want to just give you my disclosure about that. I love the traditional Latin mass. It is the beating heart of my priesthood. And it feels like the shepherd is beating us with his crook right now. And so, you know, that's, so I, I you know, I'm going to try to be objective, but obviously that's going to be limited to a certain extent, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to do my best. All right. So what we're going to do today is talk about what happened at first and then the how and the why to a certain extent. We're going to look at some of the major characters. We're going to look at how things uh, evolved. Was this a success or not? And uh, we'll kind of wrap up with some thoughts. All right. So what exactly happened? Why did things seem to change so much? Of course, we had the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965. It was convoked by Pope John XXIII. What you need to know about Pope John XXIII is that he, in many ways, was a traditionalist. He is the biggest defender of the Latin language of any pope in history. Okay? And so the document that he issued just eight months before Vatican II in preparation for Vatican II, it was called Vetrum Sapientia, after which I, I named the institute that I founded, the Vetrum Sapientia Institute. So John XXIII absolutely defended Latin. And he said, if anybody writes against Latin in the liturgy or in the seminaries, he's to be dismissed from seminary faculty. He said that. John the 23rd. People think John the 23rd said, out with the Latin, end with the English. It's the exact opposite. And, and liturgically, John the 23rd was also a traditionalist. See, in the 1950s, they were already changing a few things, especially during Holy Week. And some of these things were for a three-year experimental period. Well, when John the 23rd comes in, he just says, no, we're going back to the old. All right, so even himself liturgically 
was kind of a traditionalist. The big, big change, though, happens in June of 63, all right, when uh, John XXIII dies and Cardinal Montini, that's Pope Paul VI, is elected Pope, Pope Paul VI. And he's Pope from 1963 to 1978, the year of the three popes. You probably remember that. All right, so within Vatican II, uh, there is one document on the liturgy. There are 16 documents of Vatican II. There is one on the liturgy. So if you want to know what did Vatican II say about the liturgy, you have one document to read. Sacro Sanctum Concilium, okay, the Most Holy Council, okay, is the title of the document. It was the first document issued by Vatican II, and it was promulgated in December of 1963. Now, we're not going to go line by line in this document, but I will point out just a few things. Paragraph 22, number three. Therefore, no other person, even if he be a priest, may add, remove, or change anything in the liturgy on his own authority. Now, when you guys go to visit different parishes, it seems as though things are done wildly different in different parishes. But that's what Vatican II says about priests doing what they want with the liturgy. We have no right. I have no right to change one syllable because it's not my prayer. It's the church's prayer. And I have a duty to, to give to you what the church has given to me. All right. Paragraph 36. Number one, people's minds explode. There's brain matter on the wall when they hear this. Particular law remaining in force. The use of the Latin language is to be thrown out, cast aside, put in the garbage can, preserved in the Latin rites. What did Vatican II say about Latin? It is to be preserved. Did you hear a single word of Latin today at Mass? Mm -hmm. No. All right. Now, it does say a couple other things, so I can't make it that simple. Okay? So it does say that, and it's full stop, period. That's what number one says. But then number two says, but since the use of the mother tongue, it's vernacular, whether in the Mass, the administration of the other sacraments, or other parts of the liturgy, frequently may be of great advantage to the people, the limits of its employment may be extended. So even before Vatican II, some of the other sacraments, uh, elements of them were in the vernacular. Like uh, baptism would be a mix of Latin and English. The prayers of exorcisms, for instance, would have to be in Latin. The actual form of the sacrament, the I baptize you, that would have to be in Latin. But there are other uh, parts of it that could be in English. Okay, And so what this number is saying is that that can be extended, okay? This will apply in the first place to the readings and to the directives. That's telling the priest what to do. And to some of the prayers and chants, according to the regulations on this matter, to be laid down separately in subsequent chapters. Okay? And then it goes on to say, number three, that the ter territorial... Episcopal authority, so the, the U.S. bishops, for instance, would be able to lay down precisely what would be allowed in English. Okay, uh, number 54 says, uh, in talking about the vernacular, this is to apply in the first place to the readings and to the common prayer. I think that means the general intercessions. But also as local customs may warrant to those parts which pertain to the people. Okay. Um, Nevertheless, steps should be taken so that the faithful may be able to say or to sing together in Latin those parts of the ordinary of the Mass which pertain to them. All right? The et cum spiritu tuo, the, the gloria in excelsis deo, the credo nunum deum, the angus dei, the sanctus. Y'all should be able to recite it and sing it. All right? So the document's kind of talking out of both sides of its mouth. Let's, let's be honest. You get one number that says Latin to be preserved, period. But then you get some ambiguous phrases. All right, it can be extended. The vernacular can be extended. Or those parts that pertain to the people. Okay? Uh, there can be other parts. Well, what are those parts? All right, so the, the uh, uh, prima facie, this, this document reads like a conservative document. But there are these little nuggets of ambiguity placed in there by, we'll come back to him, 
the Ganini. Um, some have called these liturgical time bombs. In other words, you offer just a li enough ambiguity so that you can end up changing as you want. But you're still following the letter of the law. All right. Um, what's another section here? Oh, on, when, when it comes to music. Oh, I don't have the, the, the paragraph number, but I have the sub number. The church acknowledges Gregorian chant as specifically suited to the Roman liturgy. Therefore, other things being equal, it should be given pride of place, liturgical services. How often do you hear that liturgical chant? You never hear it. We'll do the simple English chant. I mean, that's, that's kind of there. But you see, that's the reason why I introduced the simple English chant, because I know what the document says. And I figure that people may, it may be too much if we do Latin, but maybe this could be a happy medium at least for now. Okay? Because I know what the document says. All right, a couple of things that this document does not say, but everybody thinks that Vatican II called for. Turning the altars around. I was going to bring a $100 bill with me and tape it on, on the thing. Let's see what I got. I think I, I may have. Yeah, I got a Benjamin. All right, I got a Benjamin. All right, so it is yours. If you can point out to me in Sacrosanctum Concilium what paragraph it said to turn the altars around and face the people. It is all yours. Okay. Um, or uh, to change everything into English, or um, what are the other big things? Communion in the hand. No. That's nowhere, anywhere here. That came, with the virus. that came through Belgium. They just started doing it. The Vatican said, stop. We've never done that before. They kept doing it. The Vatican said, stop. They kept doing it. The Vatican said, all right, fine. Um, but uh, lay people coming up to do readings. Nowhere. Yeah. Nowhere. Yeah. All right, so some of the things that we so associate the liturgical reforms, you will not find anywhere in this document. Okay? All right. So, um, during the council, so if that was promulgated in 1963, December, in March of 64, the first document... Uh, that would talk about implementing the changes comes out. Inter Ecumenici is the title of it. March of 1964. All right, now this document starts talking about um, where the vernacular can be used. Well, hold on. First of all, who ends up writing this document? There is the Congregation for Sacred Rites, which is the congregation in the Vatican that deals with the liturgy. It's now called Divine Worship in the Sacraments. But at any rate, they should have been the ones tasked with implementing Vatican II's reform. But it was full of conservatives. And Pope Paul VI did not want a conservative implementation. He wanted a more uh, progressive, he wanted more changes than what they could get through in Sacrosanctum Concilium. So he created an entirely new group called Concilium. All right? And he, he basically went around his Congregation for Sacred Rights and says, you know what? We're going to have a new group, and I'm going to handpick these guys. And tasking it will be this father, Anibali Bagnini. We'll come back to him. He's the central player in all of this. Okay. And so this document comes out, and it calls for things like the prayers at the foot of the altar to be shortened. It calls for the last gospel at the end of Mass. That can, that can be omitted. Uh, it calls for the St. Michael prayer can be omitted. Okay, but these are some of the things that are called for. Um, now, it goes into effect in the United States in November of 1964, first Sunday of Advent, 1964. So wherever you were, that may have been the first time you saw any liturgical changes. Now, it didn't get implemented in Rome until March of 1965, when Pope Paul VI goes to the Church of All Saints, and he builds a wall in front of the tabernacle, places a chair right in front of the tabernacle, and has mass facing the people for the first time and starts distributing communion to people standing, butt on the tongue. So instead of where Jesus was, the tabernacle, he put the presider's chair. So the priest would be the focal point. 
not Jesus in the most blessed sacrament. Sometimes you still see that in churches, that the chair is there behind the altar. And in this diocese, you're not allowed to have that. Because our bishop believes that Jesus should be the focal point, not the, not the priest. And that he also knows that it, didn't, it wasn't called for. All right. Um, so that's when the first changes started to happen. Now, uh, this, is, this is the book. If people want to know what is the Mass of Vatican II, you'll, you'll see one of my arguments today is that it is not the Mass that you experience today at all. We'll, we'll go into that. We'll go into why. I would argue if there's any book that represents the Mass of Vatican II, it is this book that was in effect from November 1964 to November of 1969. It's what's called the 1965 Missal. Okay? And so essentially... This is the pre-Vatican II missiles, 1962. It's what I say on Tuesdays here. This is essentially this, with a couple of modifications that I mentioned, and uh, there's more vernacular in it. But it is the same book, just a new edition, okay? This is not. We'll get to it. Um, Enter Kaminici. Okay. So those are the first um, changes. Now, a lot of people went, uh, went wild with the vernacular. You heard what Sacrosanctum Concilium said, like a moderate implementation of some vernacular. But then in a lot of places, basically the entire Mass was being said in Latin with the exception of the Eucharistic prayer. Okay. So when the priest says, this is my body, this is my blood, that had to be in Latin. You couldn't do that in English. And it was in a low voice, the Eucharistic prayer. It was silent. That's another thing that Vatican II didn't call for was making the Eucharistic prayer out loud. That's a tradition that goes back to the first century for us. All right. All right. So, but a couple years later, 1967, is another document comes out. Trace Abhinkana, so three years ago. Um, and it gives even more changes. Again, this is a post-Vatican II document. Vatican II is not writing this document, but a committee headed up by Bignini is. And so that calls for, you guys see the, the vestment that I wear, the maniple? It's in 1967 that becomes optional, okay? And the other big thing is that you can say the Eucharistic prayer in English and out loud. So those are the two major changes in 1967. Okay. Now, 1969 is the big, big kahuna. It's what's called the Novus Ordo Mise, the New Order of Mass. Okay? So, Bignini and his buddies early on are convincing Pope Paul VI, you don't understand, we need a whole new book. We need a whole new book. And so that's what they were able to uh, convince Paul VI to do. So they created this book. A couple uh, things about it. People think, all right, people think that the, the English Mass that we have today is simply the Latin Mass, except that what? It's in English. That is not true. All right? Throw that idea in the trash can. Or better yet, the garbage disposal in the sink and, and hear it grind. Because it's a bad idea. It's not, it's not true. Okay, uh, it's an entirely new book. Entirely new. Um, sure, are there elements that look like uh, the old Mass? Yeah, there's Lent, there's Easter, there's Advent, of course. But what percentage of the prayers in this book are the same as this book? 17%. 17 Is that the same thing? So if you guys are car people and at what point when you start removing parts of your car if you remove 83 percent of your car and put different new pieces on is it the same car? that's a philosophical question all right but only 17 percent is the same everything changed what else changed roughly i don't have the exact number but uh father bouillet he says it's two-thirds Two out of three saints were either removed or 
their date was changed. It dri- yeah, so, and a lot of times it's only by a couple days, which drives me crazy. So if you go to all my masses during the week, of course I say one Latin mass and two English masses, sometimes we have the same saint at the Latin mass on Tuesday as on the English mass on Thursday. Or sometimes we miss it entirely because the entire calendar of the saints changed. Two out of three changed. So imagine just the, the rhythm of the European Christian heart you know, that there's a cycle of feast days that were very important for these little villages. They'd have big feasts. And then all of a sudden, oh, sorry, your feast days moved to, you know, uh, two days later or is removed entirely. Um, you know, there's some saints that were taken out and you have parishes named by that saint. Like, okay, well, what do we do here? <laughs> Imagine if they took St. Jude out of the calendar. Like, what would we do on St. Jude's feast day? But that, that did happen. Um, the Octave of Pentecost was removed. So what's an octave? So the really important feast days, Christmas and Easter, they're so important that you celebrate it for uh, eight days, octave, okay? And so you're unpacking this great mystery. Well, liturgically, all right, the most important day is, is Easter, mm-hmm. the Easter vigil especially. Okay. Uh, but then the second most important, honestly, isn't Christmas, although maybe theologically, whatever, we can make these arguments. But liturgically, historically, Pentecost was about this far away from the Easter Vigil in terms of importance. It's the Holy Spirit. You only have three divine persons, and only two of them came to earth. Like, his coming is important. And so the the Pentecost was absolutely hugely important. Um, That got removed. The, The octave of Pentecost, just completely gone. Now, Bugnini later says that this was regrettable. Well, you know, uh, an entire liturgical season was removed. The season of Septuagesima. Those are the two and a half weeks before Ash Wednesday. So you'll notice around that time at the Latin Mass, I'm already wearing violet. Because it's that pre-Lenten period. We're preparing for Lent. You know, I usually make the joke, you know, people, you know, party on Fat Tuesday and on Ash Wednesday, they have a hangover and like, yeah, ready for Lent. Like, no, you're not ready for Lent. (laughs) You're walking in with a hangover. You need to prepare. Um, I just read, I'd never read this before. I read it in a footnote today that Bugnini wanted to get rid of Ash Wednesday. Imagine that. They almost got rid of Ash Wednesday. God, Moses. Uh, Ember days. Completely removed. Um, those are the, for the four, we're not going to go into it all, but these were important. These go back at least to the second century. And Pope Leo the Great says it's of apostolic origin that four times during the year, there were special penitential days, ember days. They threw those out. A lot of the vigils before, so the day before major feasts, uh, a lot of those vigil days were completely removed. Rogation days, completely removed. Okay. Um, so they changed a lot and it wasn't just the mass. Now we're going to be focusing more on the mass. I'll just make a brief comment. They changed every sacrament entirely. They threw out every old book and they said, let's build something new. So baptism completely changed. Even confession. It's like, why did you have to change confession? Um, I still use the old formula. Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, so they changed all the sacraments entirely. The, uh, the book that we use to bless things, the Roman ritual, they completely threw out. They gave us what's called the, the book of blessings. All right? And every young priest knows that this book of blessings doesn't bless a dang thing. Think about that. It doesn't bless a thing. Because they changed the idea of blessing. They reverted back to a Jewish understanding of blessing. They walked away from a Christian understanding of blessing. And so instead of like blessing this object, like I will bless this book, the Jewish understanding of blessing is while I read this book, I'm blessing God. That's a difference. That's a huge difference. And so even the theology of blessing changed. Exorcisms. Why did they have to change the rite of exorcism? It was 1,700 years old, and it worked. 
And no exorcist uses the new rite of exorcism. One told me he thought that uh, demons were part of the committee that put it together. <laughs> because it just doesn't work. Nobody uses it. And exorcists use Latin, by the way. The devil hates Latin. The, uh, the Breviary is the, the, the book. So if you ever see me in the confessional or somewhere at the book, usually it's the Breviary. It's the uh, Liturgy of the Hours, um, the Divine Office. It's praying the Psalms throughout the day. That was entirely changed. So if there are 150 psalms, uh, the reformers were so embarrassed by seven of the psalms because they used more graphic language, they completely threw out seven psalms that are divinely inspired. They threw out because it's too offensive to the modern ear. Um, in preparation for holy orders, everything changed. We used to have tonsure, which made somebody a cleric made you a holy object. So early on in seminary, you were tonsured, and that's when you were given the cassock. You were made a holy thing. So let's just say you violated the sixth commandment against purity. If you're a cleric, made a cleric at tonsure, you not only violate the uh, sixth commandment, you also commit the sin of sacrilege because you're a sacred person. You're reserved for the Lord. And so seminarians would hold themselves as sacred objects. Not that they were ordained yet, they weren't, but this was an important part of preparation for being a sacred person the rest of your life. So tonsure, uh, that was removed. The minor orders, which were rites of ordination. So uh, of porter, of lector, of exorcist, of acolyte. Completely, it, the entire idea of minor orders was thrown out. Um, and now they just have ministries of lector and acolyte. What's a ministry versus an order? Well, it's an ordination versus just allowing somebody to do something. It's some, it's the ordination is more ontological. It's on the level of being. It's who you are. And these things taught seminarians who and what they are, not just what you do. That's the huge difference between the old and the new. The old says who you are. The new says this is what you do. Obviously, it shouldn't be exclusive, mutually exclusive. It should be both and. But there's a loss of who we are. And so we wonder why there's a lack of priestly identity today. Uh, the subdiaconate was completely thrown out. Subdeacons were around since the 200s. Okay, so we have deacon, priest, and bishop. Those go back to the time of the apostles. By the 200s, you also had subdeacons, which was just one step away from the diaconate. And that's when you made your promise of celibacy, by the way. They completely threw out the subdiaconate. We'd had that since the 200s. I can read St. Cyprian talking about subdeacon so-and-so uh, bringing a message uh, to whomever in Italy. But they threw it out. Nowhere in this document did it say to do any of these things. All right. So when the new mass comes into effect... The old mass is not technically abrogated. It's not technically forbidden. But every, everybody had the impression that it was strictly forbidden. And so you had the debate raging in the church. Is this old mass forbidden or not? You even had a commission of cardinals in the 1980s who investigated the matter. And they concluded that no, it wasn't abrogated. And therefore it's not forbidden. All right. So, uh, but at any rate, they were treated, people were treated as though it was forbidden. <clears throat> Imagine that. The mass of, at that point, just countless centuries, all of a sudden, in effect, <clears throat> forbidden. And if you said it, you would get in trouble. And if you were a priest and you kept saying it, they would take your right uh, away to, take, uh, to, to say mass. And those priests would say, it was never forbidden. But bishops across the world said, tough luck, it's gone. Out with the old, in with the new. And so you had a small system in the church. You had a chunk of people say, the church doesn't have the right to throw away the old liturgy. And they kept going to it under the leadership of Archbishop Lefebvre, who headed up the Society of uh, St. Pius X. And I say schism, I don't, that's a whole nother thing. 
but there was a group that continued saying the old mass, even when they got in trouble. Um, and the crazy thing is, is that, so a bunch of years later, in 2007, 7707, Pope Benedict XVI issues Samorum Pontificum, okay, which was the biggest thing he did in his pontificate period, by far. He basically allowed any priest of the Roman Rite to be able to say the Old Mass. No permissions needed. You can say it. And so I was in seminary under this document. That's the agreement. I was ordained under this agreement. We'll get to that in a second. But uh, he also said in this document that the Old Mass was never abrogated, was never forbidden. So imagine that you had entire communities who for you know, 40 years were treated as if they were ecclesiastical criminals because they held on to the old mass. And their argument was, it is still permitted. And then you have a pope who comes around and says they were absolutely right. Okay. This is why we're having this talk. Last month, Traditiones Custodes is the latest document on the Latin mass. Technically, it's the guardians of tradition. Uh, that can also be translated the jail keepers of tradition. <laughs> or traditio is not only tradition, it's also um, a betrayal. So the guardians of betrayal. So there are all sorts of names being given to this document. But I already mentioned that. It's essentially an eviction document. Pack your bags. I don't care what the former agreement was. You're a danger. Get out of here. Well, we'll we'll try to we'll come we'll come to that uh, a little bit later. All right. So these these are just sort of you know the facts. What's going on? All right. The how and the why to the best of my ability. Pope Paul VI. I mentioned him. Uh, he's a sort of a tragic figure. Honestly, I haven't read enough about him to get a sense of where he was. On one hand, he was absolutely dive in head deep into reforms. Okay, let out with the old, in with the new, absolutely. But then, there are other, he also has this tragic side of thinking, this thing has gone awry. This thing is a travesty. And by 1972, he very famously said, publicly, that the smoke of Satan has entered into the church and reached even into the sanctuary. At the council, we thought we were going to experience um, a new springtime. I forget the exact word he used. But instead, storms came. He's a very, very tragic figure. Um, but he was also uh, friends with Saul Alinsky. He was friends with Saul Alinsky. So I'm just going to let that linger. Okay. Okay. And so, all right, so that's enough on, on Pope Paul VI. Um, Archbishop Hannibale Bagnini. It's this guy right here. All right. I was going to find a less flattering picture of him, but I didn't want to waste the ink. Um, so, Archbishop Bagnini. I'm sorry, I'm trying to be objective here. Um, so, he was a Vincentian, uh, he studied liturgy. And under Pope Pius XII, the waning years of Pope Pius XII, I mean, he was getting pretty weak. And uh, at any rate, some funny business was starting under him. But when Pope John XXIII came to office, he sent uh, Bignini into exile. All right. So Bignini had an important uh, post teaching liturgy at the Pope's own seminary at the Lateran. And John XXIII, it's like, this guy's got funny ideas. He's out. So he was out. But then John XXIII died, and Montini is elected pope, and who comes back on the scene is Bagnini. He ends up being the, the uh, chief uh, author of Sacrosanctum Concilium, okay? Uh, so his fingerprints are all over it. And then he headed up the, uh, the group to implement the document, okay? Now, here is a quote from Bagnini. A direct quote from March 19th, 1965. What, in his, as he approached liturgical reform, what was his intention? 
quote, we must strip from our Catholic prayers and from the Catholic liturgy everything which can be the shadow of a stumbling block for our separated brethren, that is, for the Protestants. All right, so Bignini's purpose was to Protestantize the Catholic liturgy with the hopes that Catholics and Protestants will be brought back together. So there are two elements that Protestants believe that you can see in the new liturgy very clearly. First of all, the majority of Protestants do not believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And so all the rituals, all the rites, all the gestures that suggest adoration were stripped away. So that's why, for instance, you were, let's say you're a lector in another parish, and you know, the, the priest would probably say, all right, when you come up to read, you come up and you bow. That's because that was the idea. They didn't want people to genuflect because that suggested adoration. And so just the removal of almost all of the genuflections uh, was just one example of trying to please the Protestants who do not believe that we should be worshiping a piece of bread. Now, the second element, and even the, the Protestants are even more unanimous on this point, is that they reject the idea of sacrifice. They reject the idea of sacrifice. They think it's a blasphemous idea. And so, Pugnini got to work in removing all of the symbolisms of and the rituals, the gestures that connote sacrifice. So, at the traditional Latin Mass, I, I make the sign of the cross over the host and over the chalice almost constantly. At the English Mass, it's like once. So that would just be one, one example. Or just the very fact that in the Old Latin Mass, every, every movement is prescribed for me. It is highly ritualistic. And so people can say, oh, well, that's just empty whatever. It's like, well, you can look at it as empty whatever, or you can see it as entering into. Just like actors in a, in a stage, uh, they are given their script, their, their lines, and they enter into a role, okay? And so at any rate, I feel as though I'm absolutely within my right to say that Bignini Protestantized the Mass. Um, and, it's, and again, this isn't a tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. These are his own words. All right. Now, that's just one example of uh, maybe things weren't done as pristinely as we all figure. You know, we all figure, you know, if the church is going to have a big council and it's going to start changing stuff, everything's going to be on the up and up, Right. Okay, well, uh, here's going to be a couple more examples. All right, so Father Louis Bouillet was one of the top liturgists, so the guy who really knew the history of the Mass. He was probably the top guy at Vatican II and after Vatican II. And so he was part of the group for reforming. And he wrote his memoirs, but he said they're not to be published until after his death. He died in 04, they are published in French, and then a friend of mine translated them into English, they were made available in 2010, 2011. And so he gives a couple of um, examples of what happened. In talking about Bagnini, you know, here's just a, a little uh, quote from his, uh, his memoirs. To finish with the sad tale, I shall point out what subterfuge Bagnini used to obtain, uh, to, used to obtain what was closest to his heart. All right, so what Benini would uh, be able to try to do. Uh, on several occasions, whether the scuttling of the liturgy of the dead or even the incredible enterprise to expurgate the, the Psalms for the use of the divine office, I mentioned that you throw out seven Psalms, Bagnini ran into the opposition from the group, uh, the group of experts. He ran into the opposition that was not only massive, but also, one might say, close to unanimous. But in such cases, he didn't hesitate to say, but the Pope wills this. And after that, of course, there was no question of discussing the matter any further. So in other words, what you had was you had Pope Paul VI, and then you had Concilium, and in between would go Bagnini. All right? He was the point man. So he would go between Pope Paul VI and the group. And Bouillet, who was part of this group, was saying, um, you know, Bignini would run into opposition. He would say, the Pope wants it, though. Yet one day, 
when and he goes, he was going to visit somebody uh, near the papal apartments. Um, he, uh, as I was coming back down from an elevator, Bignini in person was emerging from the staircase on his way from the Bronze Gate. At the sight of me, he didn't just turn pale, he was visibly aghast. I straightaway understood that knowing me to be known to the Pope, he supposed that I'd just been at the Pope. But in my innocence, I simply could not guess why he would be so terrorized at the idea that I might have had an interview with the Pope regarding our, the, the liturgy. But I was given the answer, uh, though, a few weeks later by Pope Paul VI himself. As I was discussing our famous work, um, the, the liturgy changes, work which he had finally ratified without being much more satisfied with it than I was. So Bouillet was saying Paul VI was not happy with the reforms. Uh, Paul VI said to me, now why did you do X in the reform? Whatever it was. At this point, I must confess that I no longer recall spe specifically with what details was bothering him. Naturally, I answered, why? Simply because Bugnini had assured us that you absolutely wished it. His reaction was instantaneous. Can this be? He told me himself that you were unanimous on this. So in other words, Bignini was telling uh, Pope Paul VI that the experts wanted whatever reform. And then he was telling the experts, the Pope wants this. And Bignini, uh, or excuse me, Bouillet writes about this. Okay. So this is the type of man Bignini was. And we're not even, yeah, we'll get to the really juicy stuff in a minute, <laughs> if that's not enough. All right, um, a couple other things. The octave, um, so if we think this was a pristine reform that the church wanted, here's another example for you. It comes to us from Father John Zulsdorf. He's the one who brings it into the English-speaking world about the octave of Pentecost, which we were just talking about. Uh, so the story goes that uh, in early uh, 1970, the new mass is in effect, and it's the day after Pentecost. It's Pentecost Monday. Pope Paul VI goes into the sacristy to prepare for Mass. And he sees green vestments laid out, which suggests ordinary time. He said, why are the green vestments laid out? It's the Octave of Pentecost. His Master of Ceremony says, oh no, the Octave of Pentecost has been suppressed. Paul VI asked, by whom? And he said, by you, Holy Father. So that's one example. Or another example. Here's another, here is a, here's another example. All right, so there used to be just one Eucharistic prayer, and it's the one that you always hear me say in English. I don't say any other Eucharistic prayers in English. So in the new Mass, there are four main Eucharistic <laughs> prayers that you can choose from. That's why you, from Mass to Mass, you're going to be wondering, all right, is he going to choose the short one or the long one with all the names? Okay? And you know which one I'm choosing. This is why I'm choosing it. This is why I only use number one. Because uh, the other three were just put together in the 1960s. So Bouillet was the one, he's the one who wrote Eucharistic Prayer 2, which is the shortest one, which is the one that priests always go to if their homily goes long, okay? <laughs> so this is what Bouillet has to say about Eucharistic Prayer number 2. Quote, you'll have some idea of the deplorable conditions in which this hasty reform was expedited when I recount how the second Eucharistic Prayer was cobbled together. A certain Benedictine monk and I were commissioned to patch up its text with a view to inserting these elements, which were certainly quite ancient, by the next morning. He had one night to write Eucharistic Prayer number two. Still, I cannot reread that improbable composition without recalling the Trastevere Cafe Terrace, where we had to put the finishing touches on our chore in order to show up with it at the Bronze Gate at the Vatican uh, in time that they were told to. So they got up early the next day, went to a Trastevere cafe, had some espresso, and finished Eucharistic prayer too. <laughs> All right. I could go on and on and on. Those are just a few examples. All right, let's look at the numbers. How did things go? Was this a success? You business owners, you should pay attention. This is 1965, and unfortunately, these numbers are from 2002, but they prove a point. All right, so how did the, re the biggest reform in church history go? All right, 
1965, there was 1,575 priestly ordinations. 2002, 450. Uh, in 1965, there was only 1% 1 of parishes without a priest. 2002, 15%. 1965, there were 49,000 seminarians. 49,000 seminarians to 4.7,000. 4,700 seminarians. This is 2002. This is almost 20 years ago. Uh, 1965, 180,000 Catholic nuns. By 2002, 75,000. And their average age then was 68. It is probably, it's probably 80 by now. Um, okay, there was, 1965, 104,000 teaching nuns. Today, or 2002, uh, 8,200. That's a decline of 94%. Okay. Um, Jesuits, uh, Jesuit seminarians, 1965, almost uh, 3,559 seminarians. 2002, 358. Christian Brothers, 1965, there was 912 seminarians. 2002, 7. Um, ah, 1965, there were 338 annulments in the United States. 2002, 50,000. In 1958, actually, but I'm sure it's the same in 65, 75% of Catholics went to Mass. Today, the same is pretty much the same as 2002, 25 percent. Isn't 2002 when all the scandals? Were and that's pre two waves of scandal. Now I don't know to what extent because the scandals were they came out in July 6, or excuse me, January 6, 2002. I don't know if these numbers reflect that or not. But let's just imagine things aren't going the right direction. All right, if you're a business owner and your numbers start tanking, what do you do? All right. The best example I've ever heard, best analogy I've ever heard on this is Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is the best product out there, period. Boom. It was doing great. And then 1980s, what did they come up with? New Coke. New Coke. And who was, the, who was the main spokesman for New Coke? Bill, America's dad. Bill Cosby, which probably wasn't good. <laughs> So they completely changed, they, they were on top of the world, they completely changed their formula, they put countless money into branding, you know, marketing this new product, they got new Coke, what happened? Boom! And then, but you're in to make money, right? You realize that's not sustainable, right? So what they come up with after that? Coca-Cola Classic. And the numbers went back up. Our numbers have tanked since 1965. And the minority of bishops even recognize this as a problem. Now, all the young clergy, we all see this, and we all know this is a travesty, and clearly something went awry. All right? Now, people will say, look, the culture changed. That's true. But when the culture changed so dramatically... And I might add the exact same year that we took the St. Michael prayer out of Mass, by the way. Wow. Um, when Catholics needed stability the most, that which seemed to be unchangeable changed. So can you blame everything on these changes? Probably not everything. But can you say it was just the culture? We know that would be a lie. Okay. The French Revolution happened. Not everything the 100 years later can be blamed on the French Revolution, but you can't ignore the French Revolution. This is on the magnitude of the French Revolution in the Catholic Church, period, except without the beheadings. <laughs> all right, so let's, um, all right, so those are the numbers. Now, Pope Benedict XVI, this stuff is not lost on him. He knew, and he knew that the liturgy was very important. His 25 years as a cardinal, he only published one book. The Spirit of the Liturgy. There are a ton of books with his name on it, but those are talks, interviews, um, lectures given. He sat down and he penned one book. And in the introduction, he says, it's because I'm afraid the liturgy is going to be destroyed unless we do something. And we, the liturgy is way too important. How we worship God is way too important. Okay? And 
you know, he begins by talking about the golden calf. And um, he says, you know, the problem with the golden calf is not so much that they were worshiping a different God. They were worshiping God, but in a way that they wanted. They were creating worship. Aaron was creating the golden calf. Creating worship of the true God, but creating their own worship. While Moses on top of the mountain receiving worship. Do we receive how God is to be worshipped or do we create? All right. And because we're liturgical beings, we were created to worship God. This is a very important topic. So the way that we approach the liturgy and the liturgy itself is hugely important. So at any rate, um, this is what, uh, as a cardinal, in 1997, Cardinal Ratzinger, eventually Pope Benedict, had to say about the liturgical reforms. Quote, I am of the opinion, to be sure, that the old rite, the, the Latin Mass should be granted more gen- should be granted more generously to all those who desire it. It's impossible to see what could be dangerous or unacceptable about that. A community is calling its very being into question when it suddenly declares that what until now was its holiest and highest possession is strictly forbidden, and when it makes the longing for it seem downright indecent. So how on one day do you say this is the holiest thing that the Catholic Church has to offer the world? The holiest thing in the sight of heaven. And then the next day you say, that's bad. And it's forbidden. He says the community calls into its, its very existence into question. You are destroying your identity if you're saying that which was your holiest thing one day becomes bad and forbidden the next day. So he becomes Pope in 2005, and in 2007 gives us some more in Pontificum. Here's just a couple of uh, quotes from that. What earlier generations held as sacred remains sacred and great for us too, and it cannot be all of a sudden entirely forbidden or considered harmful. Immediately after the Second Vatican Council, it was presumed that requests for the use of the 1962 missile would be limited to the older generation which had grown up with it. But in the meantime, it has been, uh, it has clearly been demonstrated that young persons too have discovered this liturgical form, felt its attraction, and form and found in it a form to encounter with the mystery of the Most Holy Eucharist particularly suited to them. That's me. <laughs> That's my entire generation. And I guarantee if you see a young couple, especially with more than two kids, they're going to the Latin Mass. I guarantee you. And if you go to the Latin Mass in in larger parishes, we're in a unique situation out here. It is full of young families and little kids. It's absolutely full. All right. And um, so, you know, in terms of the numbers of Latin Mass, it's still small. But I think what certain people at the Vatican are worried about is not how small it is, but how fast it's growing. During COVID alone, virtually all the Latin mass communities grew by not uh, uh, double, but also triple and quadruple the number of people because they were the ones most open during the pandemic. Okay, Um, And also they see the seminarians and the young priests, you know, as you know, loving the Latin Mass. And you can imagine that if you're a cleric, and let's say you're, you're much older, and you spend your entire ecclesiastical career in service to the reform, and then all of a sudden, like 40, 50 years later, the next generation is not following you. In fact, is going the opposite direction. You can imagine that they're feeling very self-conscious about that. And wondering, did I waste my entire ecclesiastical career? Um, you know, it, just by them liking the Latin Mass, I feel threatened. Okay? And I think that's what accounts for the draconian measures. Now, we talked about the numbers going down. If you're running a business and your numbers are going down, that's a problem. Now, what if or you have diversified your business and there, there are different departments and all the departments have been going down? But what if one of the departments started ticking back up? In fact, rather dramatically. Would you shut that department down? 
That's what's going on right now. Because the one department in the Catholic Church are the, the seminarians attached to the Latin Mass. And their numbers have grown. Let me give you an example. In this diocese, so I've been working in vocation since 2013, but I became the promoter of vocations in 2015. Okay, so I was the recruiter, essentially. My game plan was very simple. You let the Latin Mass breathe freely. You expose these young men to the Latin Mass, and they will come flocking to the seminary. Not that it's going to be the only thing that they see or touch. I'm not saying that. Because the vast majority of souls are in English mass parishes. This is why I'm here, because I'm interested in saving souls. Okay, Even though I love the Latin mass, I sacrifice that love in order to be with y'all. Because, look, my family's in an English mass parish. Like These are where souls are. And um, at any rate, when I came into that position in 2015, we had 15 seminarians. Five years later, we had 41. Let me give you some, and this not, it's not me. This is my point. It's not me. That number's continuing to grow, and I've left the vocations office because I'm <laughs> too out in the boonies. Um, let me give you a comparison. Uh, so Archdiocese of New York has 31 seminarians. Archdiocese of Chicago, 35 seminarians. Now, granted, I know Chicago goes down to South America and essentially buys seminarians. Okay. Um, that's where they, they even had the Casa Jesu, um, or Jesus, in Chicago, because they would go down and grab a handful, mostly Colombian, and bring them to Chicago. So they weren't even growing their own seminarians. I don't know what those numbers are. I could be very careful, because some of our, Span some of our uh, seminarians look Hispanic, but they're all from the diocese. It's not like we went to Mexico or Colombia uh, and said, hey, we want you know half a dozen of you guys. Okay, So we grew our own... Uh, seminarians. So if New York and Chicago, they both have about two and a half million Catholics. Those are their numbers, 31 and 35 seminarians. Di uh, Diocese of Charlotte, we have a half a million Catholics. And right now we have 45 seminarians. All right. So obviously I think um, it's, these numbers don't have to keep going down. Um, and there, there is a solution to this. But some people who are at the end of their careers and are the highest in the, in, the, in the hierarchy, they feel threatened by this, and they're trying to shut it down. Like, the church is on life support right now, and this is one area actually doing very well. And they're trying to shut it down. We need to pray. And the, the, this document is only the beginning. Next month, the leaders of the Latin Mass communities in the church have been summoned to Rome. And they're preparing for the worst. Okay? You know, a time when basically everything has been permitted in the church. They are, they are beating to death these people just because they like the Latin Mass. Isn't there some parishes that are just dedicated to Latin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that would mean that they would have to reform those parishes back into the vernacular of the nation? Or end up selling them, because again, they, they're usually in the really bad side of town. And the only reason they're in use is because the bishop said, this is the church I can give you. Um, but imagine that. A community, minding its own business, puts in a million, two million in renovating a downtown church, um, and then is told to pack their bags. The, the cruelty of this is unbelievable. Why are they not forbidding the LGBTQ masses? That directly goes against our Catholic teachings. Those aren't being forbidden, but these are. So at any rate, it just, um, you can go down a dark hole when you start asking these why questions. Now, all right, let me uh, wrap up then with just a couple of thoughts. Um, again, I'm rather confident in saying I believe that the English Mass as we have it is not the Mass of Vatican II, period. All right? And even the highest people in the hierarchy are saying that it is, and it is not, because for the reasons I just gave you. If you want a Mass of Vatican II, it is this book. Um, okay. The big question is whether or not a rupture occurred at or after Vatican II or not. Was there a rupture? Was there a out with the old, end with the new? 
you know, immediately after Vatican II, there was that sense of rupture, even though the church never officially said that. There was that sense by strictly forbidding, or in effect, not allowing Latin Mass, even though technically it was never forbidden. There was that sense of rupture, that we had to change things, we had to update things, etc. But then Pope Benedict comes into office, and he tries to push this continuity vision, that we have to see things through the lens of continuity, that Things can't be one way before Vatican II and another way after. We have to see it as continuing, as the same thing, but growing. Um, but then this latest document reverts back to rupture. It re reverts back to the idea that, all right, what was before Vatican II stays back there. The liturgy and the theology. Because that's the other thing. This mass represents the old uh, the old. Uh, theology, the old faith. There's no escaping that. It is so crystal clear in this Mass that it represents the old faith. But there's a sense that the faith has changed and that you need a new ritual in order to reflect the new faith. Um, and so this is why, instead, of, people ask me, why do they have such an animus against it? Why is there such a visceral reaction? And when you read this document, I mean, this person was clearly like an angry blogger, you know, putting this thing together with no containing of emotion. I mean, it is, it is uh, dripping with, um, with hatred. It really is. And so I think it's because they, they just see it as that is the old and we've invested in something new. And um, at any rate, that, but that's a question I can't answer. You know, did thing, was there a rupture or was there not a rupture? That's too big of a question for us to tackle here. But that is, I think, the central question. I will give you this quote, though, from Carter Ratzinger. The liturgical reform in its concrete real realization has distanced itself even more from its origin. The result has, been a, the result has not been a reanimation, but devastation. In place of the liturgy, fruit of a continual development, continual development, they have placed a fabricated liturgy. They have deserted the vital process of growth and becoming in order to substitute a fabrication. They did not want to continue the development, the organic maturing of something living through the centuries. And they replaced it in the manner of a technical production by a fabrication, a banal product of the moment. Yeah, these are the things that we read in seminary. And these are the things that we know. And so how do we as priests deal with this? I mean, this is a question for us, but I just let you kind of hear these questions, what we're thinking. Like, how do I deal with this? Y'all didn't know this today. I did. Um, and so what do I do as a priest? When it seems like the Vatican was asking for these things, but I give you all these... Uh, facts and anecdotal stories that suggest the exact opposite. I don't know. I think it's too big for us to, to, to know. I trust that Providence is uh, very much at play right now. And I suspect that because everybody wants to know, well, since this document is so just vicious, what in the world happened? Why? Why? And so that, this is my attempt today to, um, to answer that. I will end with this quote. This is from the papal coronation oath that was uh, implemented in the year 678. 180 popes took this oath upon his coronation. Pope Paul VI was the last one to do it because he threw it out. Quote, I vow to change nothing of the received tradition and nothing thereof I have found before me guarded by my God-pleasing predecessors to encroach upon, to alter, or to omit to permit any innovation therein. There you go. All right, uh, so I'm, I can keep going on, but uh, I'm done. Any questions? Yeah? Father, does Pope Francis' document fall under his uh, infallibility? No. No, it is not an infallible document. Pope Francis has not done anything infallible during his pontificate. Um, thoughts? Uh, under uh, this do document that we've 
dealing with right now. Uh, you can't open any new parishes. That's what it says. You can't open any new Latin, uh, Latin parishes. Yeah. What, uh, uh, what do uh, some of these seminarians who are devoted to this Latin mass um, going to do? What are, the, what are they going to do? I don't know. In fact, we, get, we have two transitional deacons who, uh, praise God, will be, uh, or God willing, will be ordained priests this coming spring. And according to the, and they, they're already committed. They made their, their vows of celibacy. They're locked in. And according to this document, Bishop Jugas will have to go get special permission, groveling at the Vatican uh, for special permission for his newly ordained priest to say the Latin Mass. So it's not just a matter of they can't go to a new parish, but each or, uh, newly ordained priest has to have specific permission mm -hmm. as a priest. So it's not just a parish thing, it's, an it's a priest thing. thing as well. And some bishops are trying to say that priests can't even say the Latin Mass privately. Like, just happened in Pittsburgh. Oh my goodness. Like, nobody else around. I've been a priest 10 years saying the Latin Mass, not every day, but every week for the last 10 years. And uh, because I'm already ordained, I just have to get permission from my bishop in order to continue saying the Latin Mass. I think that's a whole other issue. But uh, some bishops are going as far as saying, you can't even say this Mass on your day off alone. That's wow. I mean, what, what accounts for that type of... And think of everything else that they allow. The heresies that they allow. The, the, the politicians who publicly defy what the Catholic Church teaches and implement policies inimical to our Catholic faith, killing babies in the womb, they give them communion, but a priest on his day off can't say the Mass of Maria Goretti and Padre Pio. It is a demonic time that we are in right now, and we have got to pray for the church, we've got to pray for the bishops, we've got to pray for the Pope. And, um, and just that, well, before all that, every, that charity, like, you can tell how upset I am. Like, above all, we, you know, we have to maintain charity, but also fidelity. I mean, all sorts of questions are arising now. Does the Pope have the right to rip away an apostolic liturgy? Does he have the right? I would argue he does not have the right. Because, you know, if we, if we don't take that position, then we have to take the opposite position that the Pope has the right to do that. And if he has the right to do that, he has the right to do anything he wants. And that is what the Protestants accuse us Catholics of being. Right. It's called ultramontanism. Basically, the Pope can do anything he wants. It's voluntarism. It's your will over and against your intellect, just whatever you want. And by the virtue of you doing whatever you want, it is good. As opposed to you coming to understand what is good and exercising, willing the good. It is, um, at any rate, so it's causing all sorts of questions. And I do think this is providential. Because I think this document calls into question everything. Did Pope Paul VI have the right to implement an entirely new order of Mass, only preserving 17% of the prayers that went before us? Was that his intention? I See, that's, another good, that's that a great was, question, Les. I, I, because Is it his intention? The guy in the middle was playing both sides exactly. to, to his, his favor. I, I don't know what his intentions were. Well, he, he clearly, you know he clearly authorized a completely new missile. He had to know this thing was an entirely new thing. But, yeah, like you're saying, he was being played by Bignini. Or maybe he was telling Bouye that Bignini was playing me, and maybe he was completely fine with what Bignini was pushing. I don't know. We don't know. Um, and so it, it, it does call into question, what are the limits of papal authority? Because the liturgy is not his to toy with. The faith is not his to toy with. You don't change the Our Father. You don't say that the Ten Commandments are not absolute, which was last week's quote. Bill, did you have some? Here, Paula. Um, I'm a little bit concerned <clears throat> about you. <laughs> um, I think we all love and appreciate everything that you do and the way you present uh, today's analogy of all three Bibles. Um, yeah. 
But I'm wondering how would you navigate, how should you navigate the political arena that down the road you now put yourself in a position you will not go above any hierarchy that you should mm -hmm. be watching how you step in the political setting. Sure. You can really, we don't want to lose you. Yeah. Uh, no, I, look, I am in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I'm in the safest place I could possibly be. But we want to yeah. see. Yeah. yeah. All right. Priests, but what you don't want is a priest who is a ladder climber. Ted McCarrick was a ladder climber. You don't want that. You want somebody who's just doing his job. Right, taking the impact. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so, I mean, I'm, I'm not the only show in town, trust me. I, I'm really not. Basically, all, all the priests, about 50 and younger, to one degree or another, understand all of this. It's just that we're in this very awkward position. We don't want to go against the Pope because that's not what you do as a Catholic. But what if you know all of this stuff? Yeah, that's a problem. So at any rate, I think this will work itself out. The Italians have a phrase, fat Pope, skinny Pope. In other words, Popes come and go. There's a fat one today. There's a skinny one tomorrow. There'll be a fat one after that. And so the Italians, are like, oh, it's good. You know, they, they come and go. So, um, oh, I will, I will remind us of this. This is, uh, speaking of popes, Pope Pius XII. But what did Pope Pius XII say in the early 1930s when he was the Cardinal Secretary of State when he went to see Sister Lucia of Fatima? He walked away and he wrote to his friend, I am afraid of what Our Lady has said to little Lucia of Fatima about the dangers of the church committing suicide by the alteration of her faith, her theology, and her liturgy. That was in the third And so was the third secret completely revealed? Well, that was a, that's a whole other topic. But why did, why did Pius XII say that? And why did Sister Lucia say that in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved, etc., dot, 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 okay? Leading into the third secret. It was about dogma, like what Pius XII was saying. And why did Our Lady tell Lucia to tell the Pope, open this in 1960? Why 1960? I'm just going to leave this question for you. Of all things, 1960, open up the third secret and tell the world. And the Vatican said no. In 1960, February 1960, they said no. Pius XII is dead. Well, Pius XII is dead, but what had been announced in 1959, Second Vatican Council. So open this letter by in 1960, and Lucia asked why, and Our Lady said, because it will be clearer then. I'm not condemning the 16 documents of Vatican II. I'm not doing that. I'm simply asking the question, why 1960? Why did Pope Pius XII talk about suicide by changing the, the, the doctrine and the liturgy? And why did we get all this stuff? We don't know. Bernie? Just a quick question, Father. Was there any conversation about this during the papacy of John Paul II? There's a big gap in time where was the church just quiet on the issue? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was there a conversation within the, the ranks? I don't know. I, I mean, this has become, this was a very, very small group that was considered fringe for the longest time. And then all of a sudden, this position and these facts are just growing and growing and growing. Because when you have the 2002 scandals, the 2018 scandals, the silver lining is that we start talking about the truth. And this is, this is part of it. All right. So I think we should probably wrap it up there. Let's say, Hail Mary, that Queen of Heaven and Earth will save this mess. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Dominus Bobiscum. Per nocessione beate Maria se per vergine se domnim sanctorum benedictio dei omnipotentis patris et fidi e et spiritu sancti descendit super bols et maniat semper. Amen. Amen. Thanks, y'all.